Hello, I'm George Liston CA. Welcome to Dialogue, a program that explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. The nation of Bangladesh came into the world in a tumult of blood and sacrifice that in its nine-month gestation echoed the birth journey of a human being. This is poetic and appropriate, for the emergence of a country is a story composed of many thousands of individual tales. The passions that brought Bangladesh into being ran like a river through families and revealed themselves in deeds both noble and ignoble, with revelations of character that altered lives even as they changed landscapes. My guest is Tamima Anam, author of A Golden Age. Tamima, welcome to Dialogue. Thank you. Let me hold your fine book up for all to see and to purchase, <laughs> and especially <laughs> to read, but also to talk about, because this, it really is quite a marvelous uh, novel that you've done here. It took me back a long ways. The first time I can remember looking at a map of what was then Pakistan and East Pakistan, I was much younger, but it struck me as the most improbable proposition I'd ever seen. A nation divided by a thousand miles, basically, with an east side and a west side. For that reason, I said, this may not have long to be united. Mm -hmm. But as I read your novel, in the first few pages, I got a sense that maybe there was an even deeper impediment to it remains united. And let me be very specific. Uh, early in the book, Marcia, mm -hmm. the sister of Rehana, who is the heroine mm -hmm. of our story, she's talking about people from then East Pakistan in what I consider a very dismissive way. I actually call them Bengalis as right. opposed to Bengalis. Yeah. So my question to you, and I know you have a background in anthropology, is were there attitudes in Pakistan toward mm -hmm. East Pakistan prior to the whole independence thing that suggested disdain or, dis or some tension at least between the two parts? Well, we can never know what kinds of prejudices or assumptions existed before the birth of Pakistan, but certainly very soon after mm -hmm. the partition of India in 1947, when this very strange country was created, mm -hmm. um, on the basis of there being a, a population of Muslims, a concentration of Muslims on either side of India, mm -hmm. um, very soon after partition, um, there was an announcement that Urdu would be the state language of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Now, Urdu was only spoken by 2% of the population of, of East Pakistan. Um, and from that moment onwards, the people of East Pakistan be began a language movement. They started agitating for their language mm -hmm. um, to become officially recognized in the state. And this, of course, led to a larger kind of movement for regional secession and, and finally national independence. But it really sort of illustrates some of the problems of creating this very strange country, which mm -hmm. had only religion, the people only had religion in common. They were linguistically, ethnically, culturally very distinct. And they, of course, came with their presumptions about one another. Right, right. Now, uh, this, that's a fascinating answer. And going back to the fact, which I've, I've learned in that answer, that Urdu was only spoken by 2% of people in what was, what was East Pakistan, now Bangladesh. Uh, what's the percentage of Urdu speakers in Pakistan? Well, at the time, it was much higher, but of course, uh -huh. Pakistan itself was not an ethnically unified or ethnically homogenous state. Right. But the people who were running Pakistan were the Urdu-speaking Punjabis, mm -hmm. um, and they were the ones that were determining what the kind of national identity would be. Mm -hmm. And they encouraged everyone to forget their kind of regional cultural identities mm -hmm. and embrace a kind of pan-Islamic and Urdu-based identity mm -hmm. that would be kind of dictated by the people that were running the country from Islamabad in West Pakistan. Yeah, well, that's a non-starter, really. <laughs> it's a real formula <laughs> mm -hmm. for disaster. I, I think so. Now, this story uh, that you've written, Tamima, is told through uh, the lens, if you will, of a family, particularly Rehana, who is a, a remarkable character, youngish, I, I suppose, mm -hmm. I'm safe, maybe late 30s or something, widow, uh, who both regains her children and after a great sacrifice. Uh, her husband dies, which makes mm -hmm. her a widow, obviously, and she and she has to sort of fight for custody against her brother-in-law and, uh, uh, and his wife. Why did you choose this kind of focus? I mean, to use the family and to use this young woman's struggle and, and odyssey in many ways. Well, George, when I was thinking of writing this book, I thought I would write a very big war epic <laughs> with uh -huh. battle scenes uh -huh. and political rallies and all the things a young writer kind of imagines, taking up all of these big themes. But actually, when I sat down to write, I realized that I was much more interested in 
how an ordinary person mm. or how an, a very unexceptional family would have survived this war and what happens to ordinary people when they're plunged into these extraordinary circumstances. And Rihanna is a very reluctant revolutionary. She's not, she doesn't speak Bengali. She's not a native of Dhaka, of, of East Pakistan. Mm -hmm. She goes there to marry her husband. Um, and it's basically her journey of how she becomes a revolutionary. Right. Um, and to me, that was a more interesting kind of story to tell. And you only really see the parts of the war that Rihanna sees. Mm -hmm. It's a very limited point of view. You sort of have a sense of the larger world, but she's caught up in her kind of domestic life. She wants to protect her children. She vows that they will all come out at the end of the war with their family intact. Yeah. And that's her only motivation. That's and all why, of these things come out of that. Uh, Tamima, that's why it works, though, because, uh, you know, that it's possible for the reader to identify with that. This is not a firebrand, a revolutionary mm -hmm. from the start. This is a woman who, as you say, was really really born on the other side of the fence. Sure. And actually to a very wealthy family in the old yeah. days in India and Calcutta. But she progressively, I think, gets drawn into this. You know, first hide this, then join us with that, and that kind yeah. of thing. But it's always to her a way of, uh, particularly her love for her son. Exactly. Of keeping that family, that family together. Exactly. I mean, we talked a bit about the, um, the word golden that mm. appears here. Yeah. She builds, uh, I won't reveal key elements here, but she does build a, a, a house next to her home as a way of getting income and get the mm -hmm. kids back. It's called Shona. Yes. Which is gold. Yes. I, my research told me that the anthem of Bengal is our golden Bengal. Yes, absolutely. Am I, am I doing right so far? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so what, why did, why does all this, uh, why did you use it here? Well, Amar Shonar Bangla, which is the national anthem of Bangladesh, mm. refers to the color of the rice paddy as it's ripening. Mm. And people say that Bengal is, is a, it's my golden Bengal. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the reference to gold. Um, in sort of a national sense. In terms of the book, so th that's certainly why I wanted the word golden to be in the mm -hmm. title. In terms of the book, as you said, Rahana loses her children in a custody battle when they're very young because she's a widow and she hasn't any money and her brother-in-law says, oh, I can take care of these children better than this helpless, impoverished widow right. can. And in order to get them back, she builds a house on a derelict plot um, on her property, and she rents it out, and she gets the money, and she bribes the judge to reverse the custody order. So again, the and she names the house Shona mm -hmm. um, because she um, it's her golden opportunity to get the children back. Yeah. And the final and most important reason that I call the book a golden age is because actually, um, even though the Bangladesh war was a moment of great tragedy and a lot of people lost their lives and their loved ones. Mm -hmm. It was the beginning of the nation and it was a moment of great hope and possibility. And of course, much has happened to Bangladesh since then, mm -hmm. but it was a kind of untarnished time. Um, so I wanted to refer to that in the title of the mm -hmm. book. And well done. Speak to us about the beginnings of that nation because this whole, I mean, what makes it work, the, the structure of the book is that we follow the family, particularly Rehana, who really, you know, you get interested in her right off the bat. But we're, we're keyed here to the chronology of the developing war, the mm -hmm. Civil War, the Declaration of Independence, and mm -hmm. the uh, founding of Bangladesh. Now, here my research is not so grand, <laughs> but mm -hmm. I do, and it may, I'm remembering this a lot from having lived through the time, mm -hmm. obviously, and um, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I remember a cyclone or some kind of natural yes. disaster yes. that hit because uh, Bangladesh is a, is a coastal nation. It's Absolutely. really subject to monsoons, yeah. tidal waves, and all sorts of things. It was devastated. Yes. The um, other part of the country did not come to its aid, I guess. Exactly. That's right. Uh, well, and then, then what happens? So in 1970, there was a terrible cyclone mm -hmm. that hit um, the coast of Bengal, right. and half a million people died. Mm -hmm. And there was um, subsequently a famine. Mm -hmm. and. Um, the West Pakistani administration was very heavily criticized both within Pakistan and, and by the world for not coming to the aid of, of East Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And this kind of started a lot of the, this really brought home to people that they were not equal citizens of the country, mm -hmm. that they were a kind of colony rather than, um, you know, a wing, um, an, an equal wing of, of a country. Um, and after that, subsequent to that uh, cyclone, or around, around the same time, there was a national election. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that in that national election that all the people of East Pakistan voted for their party, mm -hmm. which was the Awami League, mm -hmm. led by a very charismatic man named Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. And because they so unanimously voted for one party, 
um, according to the parliamentary system, he would become the president or the prime minister of the entire nation. Oh, both, both wings. Both, both wings. Yes. Uh -huh. And of course, that was unacceptable uh -huh. to the people uh -huh. uh, of the Western Wing. So those election results were canceled. And a few weeks later, um, this uh, army crackdown happened right. um, when the West Pakistani administration realized that it was sort of getting out of control, that mm -hmm. people in, in the East were, their demands for uh, regional autonomy and then nationalism were sort of growing um, very steadily. Mm -hmm. And this crackdown happened, as you see in the novel. And it was a very sudden crackdown. The Pakistan army landed in Dhaka on the night of March 25th and began a campaign of genocide and ethnic cleansing, which started the war and ultimately led to... That's the Tika Khan episode? Uh, yes, it's the chapter that's called Operation Searchlight. Uh -huh. um, so the Pakistan army landed in Dhaka and decided to completely crush the revolution before it had even begun. Right, and the most oppressive um, or hard-handed... Exactly, yeah. and they thought they would just finish it once and for all, and it would be a very quick military operation, um, because of course it was a military. Um, it, it was the military against a civilian population. Mm -hmm. There was a very, very little uh, of the Pakistan army in, right. in East Pakistan, mm -hmm. so they thought, oh, you know, we're just going to crush this uh, rebellion. But they met. They met substantial resistance, obviously, on the part of the, uh, we'll say, Bangladeshis at yes. this point, uh, but also. I think I remember also India. Yes, comes absolutely. In, com comes in strong in this. Yes, the Indian government um, trained uh, what was then the the kind of burgeoning Bangladesh army. So as soon as the Pakistan army um, started committing this genocide, um, the Indian uh, a lot of people fled to the borders, and the Indian army um, sort started to support them with military training, with arms, mm -hmm. with funding, and of course millions of refugees were crossing the border into India. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, India uh, India came directly to the aid of Bangladesh. And once they did that in December of 1971, the war ended in nine days. Nine days. Yes. after nine months of... Exactly. Of, uh, yeah. Some, um, one of the... There are lots of things about... And again, this is why it's so nice, nice, important, is probably a better word, to look at this through the lens of a family because lives are changed. And many lives are ended as this is going on. And in Rehana's family, during this entire episode, we're getting a sense of how this is affecting them directly. And much can be said about each one of them. But I want to focus sure. particularly on um, the women of the mm -hmm. family, because in addition to Rehana, who is in many ways a heroic character, uh, you have her daughter Maya, mm -hmm. with whom she has a difficult relationship, which mm -hmm. does get better toward the end, but it's always a little tense. And friends of Maya, who are obviously very young too, mm -hmm. uh, women friends, one of whom I think is driving a truck at some point yes. in this, which is you know, needed for the war, but unusual for the times. So the question then, uh, Tamima, is, how did women's roles, women's roles mm -hmm. change, if they did, mm -hmm. in Bangladesh as a result of this kind of gestation, if you will? Sure. Well, I think it's one of those kinds of peculiarities of wartime mm -hmm. where all the men are off fighting and the mm -hmm. women have to play roles that they wouldn't normally be allowed to play or be encouraged to play. Right. For instance, there's a bridge in London um, that was entirely built by women during World War II. Mm -hmm. um, and they became the kind of the welders and the engineers. Um, and of course, after the war, they had to go back to their roles, which was very difficult for mm -hmm. them. Um, I think similarly, during the Bangladesh War, men and women were able to mix much more freely mm -hmm. than they otherwise would have. So, for instance, they were protesting on the streets together against the military um, dictatorship. Mm -hmm. They were um, forming, uh, you know, student revolutionary groups together. Um, and this was even before the war began. Mm -hmm. So I think student politics um, really sort of broke down the, the barriers between the genders. Um, and of course, once the war happened, people were thrown together in very unusual circumstances. Right. And um, my own personal theory is that there were a lot more love marriages around the war than uh, arranged this... marriages. Um, people kind of being thrown together in, in circumstances that they would never otherwise have been in and falling in love and discovering, um, you know, this kind of new forms of relating. I, yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned that because I want to talk about mm -hmm. love and Rahana's expression of love and uh, love matches and but even before that mm -hmm. uh, how common was this phenomenon of divided families because in, we have Rahana and this uh, uh, brother-in-law actually mm -hmm. and uh, you know he's he's a kind of a well he's really a villain in many ways mm -hmm. of the piece 
but a bureaucrat who really supports mm -hmm. the government, et cetera, mm -hmm. presses her. Did, did the, did the, was there a stark dividing line among many families because of this? I think that that division was probably quite rare mm -hmm. because the majority of people in Bangladesh supported the war would have been like Rehana and her children. Mm -hmm. um, there were very few people in Bangladesh who didn't feel that um, the Pakistan army had to be resisted. Mm -hmm. And because it was such a brutal occupation, mm -hmm. um, it, there was very little room for people to actually support that occupying army because it was mm -hmm. so obvious that they were um, a violent uh, kind of committing acts of genocide. So, so I think this division um, must have existed in some families, mm -hmm. but um, it was, you know, put there for more for dramatic purpose and, mm -hmm. and isn't very illustrative of what was really going on at the time. Well, it, you know, it does, well, civil wars obviously are uh, wars and it's kind of an, a, a family of sorts. Sure. Nationally. And it really does make it stark in that sense mm. for the reader. I was also struck, as you, you mentioned several times, the kind of a, a, oppressive might of the army and its actions. I was impressed by something I hadn't realized, and that was the targets of this. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they would go after guerrillas. That's mm -hmm. you know, opponent one, so to speak. But um, Hindus yes. and communists, as they yes. were designated, mm -hmm. and separatists, obviously, yes. were also targets of this. Well, war. I think that the Pakistan army had to encourage its soldiers mm -hmm. to kill civilians. And one of the ways that they did that was by using the rhetoric of religion. So this nation that was brought together under the auspices of Islam, of religion. Um, when one side, when one faction wanted to break away, it was like an insult to the religious unity of the nation. And so they said, well, these people are not real Muslims. And they, at first they targeted the Hindu minority. And then they targeted mm -hmm. all the Bengalis because they said, oh, these people are not real Muslims, so you can you can kill them, you can mm -hmm. commit your violent acts upon them. This was a kind of a rhetoric that was used by the military. Mm -hmm. um, this kind of idea that to have a national identity that was resisting the religious identity was somehow um, committing some kind of mm. um, some kind of crime against the religion mm. that was unacceptable, and that's why the Hindus were first targeted, mm. um, and then of course other yeah. other members of the civilian population. Once again, the reader gets this through the fate of a family, Singuptas, yes. who were the tenants really mm -hmm. of Rehana and that Shona, the house you described mm -hmm. earlier. Um, let's go to love now, because uh, we said something you said a few minutes ago really is kind of uh, really intriguing to me. Rehana loved Iqbal. She did, her, her former husband, husband. Yeah. Now, I took it was an arranged marriage, but love grew. And she goes to his grave and sort of has these, if not daily, frequent sessions yes. where she explains how life is going. But in the course of all that transpires, she has a border, so to speak, uh, a guy called the Major, mm -hmm. who's a military figure who's come over to the side or mm -hmm. on the side of the, yeah. of the rebels. They fall in love mm -hmm. or in a kind of really sort of gradual mm -hmm. way. That's fascinating. I'll tell you why it's fascinating. He comes across, you know, he strikes you as a guy who can take care of himself. I imagine him as someone who's pretty impressive looking and rough and ready and, and all that. But he's, he's, uh, he's probably the gentlest person in the book, I mean, if mm -hmm. I can use that. So I don't know if it's even a question, it's more a, a kind of revelation. Mm -hmm. Here is, because as you well know, the depictions of Muslim males mm -hmm. in the Western mm -hmm. the, the art these mm -hmm. days is really not as uh, uh, deep and broad as mm -hmm. it can be. Speak to us about the major. He's a very interesting male character. Well, of course, Ruhana meets the major when he's very vulnerable because mm -hmm. he becomes injured. Right. And the reason she decides to take him in is because he was injured while trying to save her son. Mm -hmm. um, and they were they were trying to do some kind of guerrilla operation that goes awry. Mm -hmm. And the major is injured. And he, her son brings him and says, look, this man has saved my life. You have to take care of him. You have to hide him until he recovers. And so he's living in her house, and she agrees to take care of him. And they develop this friendship that starts, you know, she comes and changes his bandages and mm -hmm. brings him his food, and they don't really speak. And then they... And then um, she, Rihanna's a very lonely figure because she's a widow. She's been alone all these years. Her children have gone off to fight in the war. He's really the only person that's left. And um, I suppose you don't really see his hard military side. Mm -hmm. You see his tender side because he's wounded and he's trying to, the whole time, um, get back to the battlefield. Yeah, but in addition, he, he, the way he relates to her in that mm. tender side is so... I mean, if you were approaching it from a kind of a psychological, there's no, everything he said and did in her company was what 
was the best thing to do, mm -hmm. sort of thing. And you don't, uh, I mean, it's just there's a, there's a nuance to him that you don't often get in these. He's kind of my films. romantic hero. I thought there was some, <laughs> some kind of inspiration going on in that, in that, in that story. Um, speak to us a bit, Tamima, about the, the Indian dimension here. There's uh, Calcutta is the ancestral home. Family fortune was, Rahan, Rahana's family fortune was lost. Mm -hmm. They all end up there. That is to say, she and uh, Maya, mm -hmm. and I think Sohail passes through. Um, and as you said, India does intervene in a way that makes is very pretty decisive. Mm -hmm. Does that relationship continue? I mean, what's India and and Bangladesh like now? Well, India and Bangladesh have a very fraught relationship I now, unfortunately. So. Mm -hmm. um, during the Bangladesh War and. You know, subsequently, there were very close ties between India and Bangladesh, mm -hmm. not least because India intervened on Bangladesh's behalf, but also because Bangladesh was founded as a secular country mm -hmm. similar to India. They just fought a war with Pakistan, so there was a lot of solidarity. And, of course, the Bengalis of India and the Bengalis of Bangladesh speak the same language, and there's a lot of fraternity between, uh, you know, uh, going across the borders mm -hmm. there. Um, unfortunately, uh, things have happened mm. um, historically, geopolitically, uh, that have made that relationship very tense. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very difficult to be a country such as Bangladesh, to be enveloped on all three sides by this um, behemoth of a country mm -hmm. um, that is growing so rapidly, that has that dominates so completely. And, you know, Bangladesh is bordered on three sides by India. Um, so it feels like a big bear hug of a relationship. Right. And there are a lot of anxieties on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, and these anxieties feed into the sorts of prejudices you were talking about at the beginning. Um, and now I think Bangladeshis are quite suspicious of India. Huh. Um, they call India the big brother. Um, there are certain things that happened. You know, India built a dam upstream of Bangladesh and plunged many millions of people into dire poverty. Um, so it's called the Faraka Dam. So that was a, a big moment. Um, there are all kinds of uh, economic reasons that I can give you. There are many, many illegal Bangladeshi migrants uh, in India. So this kind of relationship is, is very, very fraught. And mm -hmm. I think it has to do with one country being so much more powerful than the other. They can never really have a relationship of equals. All right, that's, that makes sense to mm -hmm. me. Um, I really don't want to give things away with this question because this is what people should read the book for, but I'll just use a code here to say that at the, as we get to the denouement or whatever, I forget my mm -hmm. English literature, but um, there's a kind of a Sophie's choice. I'll just leave it at that. And Rehana has to make it. Mm -hmm. And of course she does. And I wondered if that was your way of kind of bringing forth the really poignant and painful moral choices that war inflicts on people. I mean, Absolutely. how you use that device. Absolutely. I mean, in, in many places in the book, people have to make choices about where their loyalties are. Mm -hmm. And for Rihanna, she is constantly being confronted between her love for her children, her desire to protect them, her desire to, she has a kind of growing sense of nationalism. And all of these things start to compete with one another. Mm -hmm. And they all culminate at the end when she has to decide um, where her real stakes are. Mm -hmm. And in a way, it's a very, very difficult choice for her. But in another way, if you think about her character and everything she's gone through, it feels almost automatic. Mm -hmm. And she says, well, this is always what I said I was going to do. Mm -hmm. um, and she makes that choice. Um, so of course, uh, like I said, it's about a very ordinary person put in, in, very ordinary, in a very extraordinary circumstance. Right. And she becomes heroic mm -hmm. as a result of that. And that's sort of what the book is about. It's about her journey towards heroism. That's well said. That is what the book is about. I mean, as a reader, I can, yeah, I'll pause mm. for that. <laughs> it's, uh, and I know that this, is, uh, this book, rich as it is, is uh, uh, part of, an, uh, of a trilogy, you might be. It is. Um, you may may or may not want to even talk about this, but is Re are we going to see more of Rihanna, or is there going to be, or you don't know yet? I well, don't. you may see more of Rihanna, but not in the next book, because mm -hmm. I'm going backwards in time, mm -hmm. and the next book will be about Rihanna's father. and the oh, back in Calcutta? Back in Calcutta. Will we learn how he got all of his money? You will learn how he got his money and how he lost his money, and it will be mm -hmm. about how his fortunes decline with the decline of the British Empire in India. That would be interesting. And just Without, without you know revealing secrets, will the loss of his money be uh, what's the word when 
things go, happen at the same time? Will it, will it happen because of the d division of it in the partition? You'll have to read the book and find <laughs> out. <laughs> First I have to write it. <laughs> Speaking of books, and, and this, uh, I'm sorry the time is running out because it's fascinating to talk with you, but this book fits in, uh, well, let me put it this way. Bangladesh has a very long literary tradition and poetic mm -hmm. tradition. Its, its history is quite rich in it. Um, is that still these days? I mean, who's writing excitingly in Are there a lot of uh, people writing excitingly in Bangladesh these days? Well, literature has always been a very, very strong and powerful aspect of our culture. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I think that um, it's difficult for people to become full-time writers, and it's something that's one of my pet projects in Bangladesh, is that I think we should develop our become consumers and writers and developer, developers of our own publishing industry. Mm -hmm. um, but people still read voraciously and, um, you know, primetime television in Bangladesh is a poetry recitation by, oh, right. you know, a Tagore poetry recitation. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's very much a very big part of the culture. Um, and I, I think that the, the, uh, in the future we'll have a larger population of people writing in English because there's so many immigrants and so many people who live outside of the country. Right. What's that poem, the, poet, the Ghazal? What's it called? Oh, Ghazal, that's actually an Urdu form. Uh -huh. But it's also been used in, in Bangla by uh, Nazrul Islam, who's one of our most well-known right. poets. Well, what, were the form, what form is dominant in uh, of poetry in, in Bangladesh? Oh, well, there's uh, many kinds of lyric poetry, hmm. um, but Rabindranath Tagore oh, of um, is our most famous poet, and there's a whole genre of literature and poetry that's sort of started by him and still continues today. Through to our our enormous enrichment. Well worth reading as is your book. Thank, Thank you. you so much for being with us. I it's thoroughly my enjoyed pleasure. It. Thank you, George. It was my pleasure, Tamima. And that's our program. We appreciate your comments and you can reach us at Dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. I'm George liston CA, and you've been watching Dialogue, a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHC Networks. Dialogue is also on the MHC Worldview Channel, which is available to public TV stations nationwide. For more information, go to www.mhcworldview.org. Please join us again right here next week, and thank you for watching this week. And thank you, Tommy Mandel. The Art of Conversation, Dialogue at the Woodrow Wilson Center, features 20 years of dialogue. Distributed by the John Hopkins University Press, www.press.jhu.edu.